former auto executive Carlos Ghosn. Carlos Ghosn. Carlos Ghosn. Carlos Ghosn was the best automotive CEO in the world. One of the most respected business executives ahead of Bill Gates. We have reached a new era. Recent journey from arrest in Japan to a parent safe refuge in Lebanon. Just picture this. The year is 2019, and this mysterious musical instrument case box that, at first glance, seems like it's hiding a musical treasure. Little did anyone know, it held within its confines none other than Carlos Gosen, the former CEO of the renowned Japanese company Nissan. I didn't run from justice. I want justice because justice is the only way I'm going to establish my reputation and the only way what I've done during my life is going to be recognized to its value. How did this high society millionaire find himself in a situation where he had to play hide and seek with Japanese airport security? And can you believe the audacious plan he hatched to break free? This story isn't just any old tale. It's a roller coaster of suspense, triumphs, and a dash of craziness that could rival any blockbuster movie. So, buckle up as we unravel the riveting escapades of Carlos Ghazan. Now, let's dive into the drama of our story. We're about to embark on a journey through the life of Carlos Ghazan, a name that echoed far and wide in recent years. Brace yourself for a narrative filled with twists, turns, and captivating details. Carlos Ghazan, a man of Lebanese roots, was a triple threat with nationalities in his pocket, Lebanese, French, and Brazilian. After wrapping up his studies in France, he found himself in the administrative spotlight at Michelin, the tire powerhouse. Climbing the corporate ladder with the finesse of a tightrope walker, he eventually found himself as the top honcho of Michelin's American division, a big league position. But hold on, the plot thickens. Michelin, being French, had strong ties with Renault, the creme de la creme of French car companies. The CEO of Renault caught wind of Carlos's stellar achievements. And like a casting director who discovered a hidden gem, he made the call. Come join the Renault stage as my right-hand maestro, he said. And just like that, Carlos packed his bags, bid adieu to Michelin, and made a grand entrance into the French automotive scene in 1996 as the deputy CEO of Renault. At that time, Renault was navigating through one of its worst periods, teetering on the edge of bankruptcy. However, within just one year of Carlos Ghosn's arrival, the company underwent a radical transformation. Finances started flowing back in, and Reno became a profitable enterprise once more. All of this was thanks to Carlos's sweeping management style. And when I say sweeping, I mean it quite literally. Carlos Ghosn's approach involved cutting any unnecessary excess within the company. He didn't just try to fix things, he reshaped the company from its roots, extending to its very fringes. The result? Closure of numerous company factories and the layoff of thousands of workers and employees sparked massive protests from affected workers in various regions and countries where the factories were shuttered. The French media dubbed Carlos the cost cutter because his no-nonsense style primarily focused on trimming sources of losses, not attempting to fix what could be cut off immediately. In this manner, Carlos Gozen managed to rescue Renault from its crisis, turning it into something better than it had ever been. Following this colossal success, Carlos aimed to elevate the company to international stardom. He envisioned Renault playing in the big leagues alongside giants like Ford and Toyota, companies that dominated the world with their cars. The idea was to form an alliance with a second global giant, a company with a well-known name worldwide. Carlos had his sights set on Nissan, the Japanese powerhouse. Nissan, though a well-known name, was undergoing a severe crisis, even more significant than Renault's, when Carlos took the helm. Nissan was drowning in a 20 billion debt, Imagine Nissan was producing over 50 car models, but only three were turning a profit. The rest were in the red. Led by Carlos, Renault proposed buying a significant stake in Nissan to rescue them from their crisis. However, this would make Renault the dominant force in Nissan, something the proud Japanese, with their strong sense of identity and industry, would typically resist. Yet the circumstances were far from ordinary. In the midst of Nissan's colossal crisis, no Japanese bank was willing to lend them money. With $20 billion in debt, everyone was anticipating Nissan's downfall. The only helping hand extended was that of Carlos and Renault. Carlos told them, give me just one year, and I'll turn the company around, making it profitable again. In three years, I'll wipe away all the company's debts. If I don't deliver, I'll resign from my position and retire from administrative work altogether. Nissan agreed to the proposal. 
In 1999, Renault acquired a stake representing around 36% of Nissan, becoming the controlling party. From this point, Carlos was appointed as the CEO of Nissan, a truly unprecedented move for a venerable and large Japanese company like Nissan. As soon as Carlos set foot in Japan, he visited every Nissan factory. He meticulously examined every aspect just as he did when he became deputy director of Renault. In a mere three months, Carlos devised a comprehensive plan to rescue Nissan from its dire situation. This plan, to put it mildly, was a game changer. Carlos closed five factories and laid off 21,000 workers and employees. As expected, these drastic measures led to massive protests with workers expressing their discontent at losing their jobs. Public opinion swayed against the alliance between Nissan and Renault reaching a point where even the workers were demonstrating against it. However, Carlos was undeterred. He was determined to break traditions, even if it meant going against the grain of Japanese customs. He started by making English the primary language of the company, a bold move aimed at achieving global success. Furthermore, he halted the seniority-based promotion system, a significant part of Japanese corporate culture, replacing it with a performance-based model. This made perfect sense rewarding employees based on their achievements rather than simply their seniority. Yet these changes, challenging Japanese traditions, earned Carlos numerous adversaries, even among the board members. Many questioned the audacity of this foreigner to come in and change things so drastically. However, the success of these changes was quickly apparent, and Nissan's situation did a complete 180. Just like his previous triumphs, Carlos Gozen achieved massive success with Nissan, as promised, Nissan returned to profitability within just one year. From here, Carlos's reputation in Japan transformed from a foreign executioner to a foreign savior. People began calling him the man with the magic touch, the one who could turn any company from loss and failure to profit and success. Carlos Gozen's name began gaining international renown, not just in Japan. He became a media sensation, winning award after award. His story even inspired a manga selling over a million copies. Carlos had become a star in every sense of the word. Imagine when Carlos entered a restaurant in Japan, people would stop in their tracks and applaud him. He had become not just famous, but respected in society. Years passed and the figures of Nissan and Renault continued to grow. In 2005, the CEO of Renault retired from his position. Carlos, previously the deputy CEO, assumed the role of managing director of Renault. Now, Carlos was the executive director of two of the world's largest car companies simultaneously, a feat unheard of in history. This, of course, put immense pressure on him. Many close to him advised him to relinquish one of the positions, but he refused. He wanted to remain the leader of the alliance he had built. During this period, Carlos received an annual salary of around $17 million. While not astronomical compared to Western CEOs, it was significantly higher than the salaries of Japanese company heads. For instance, Carlos Gosin's salary was 11 times higher than that of the president of Toyota, the largest car manufacturer in Japan. You can imagine the envy brewing in the hearts of many Japanese executives and even within Nissan's board of directors. This envy would later rear its ugly head in the unfolding events of the story. Carlos was not frugal with himself. He threw lavish parties, bought expensive items for himself and his family, owned a $10 million yacht, traveled in a private jet, drove luxurious and expensive cars, and lived a life of opulence with the hard-earned money he accumulated. But this lifestyle was peculiar to Japanese customs and traditions. In Japan, ministers and company CEOs typically don't drive to work. Some even commute by bicycle. Imagine being the foreign CEO, receiving the highest salary and flaunting this lifestyle in front of everyone. Naturally, Carlos had many detractors, and this resentment would later manifest on November 19, 2018. On that fateful day, Carlos had a meeting with Nissan's board of directors. At the time, he was in France, in Paris, with his family. He planned to take his private jet and fly to Tokyo. Carlos bid farewell to his family, boarded the plane, and took off for Tokyo. However, upon landing at Tokyo Airport, Carlos was astonished to find Japanese police waiting on the runway. They surrounded him with their cars, entered the plane, and arrested him. Puzzled, Carlos asked them why they were arresting him, and they informed him that he faced charges related to financial misconduct. When he pressed them for details about the alleged financial misconduct, the police remained silent, apprehending him and placing him in custody. The news spread rapidly across Japanese and global media, leading to a sharp decline in Nissan's stock. While Carlos sat in custody, 
Unaware of the charges against him, he expected his company, Nissan, to stand by him and send him a lawyer for defense. However, to his surprise, Nissan's board of directors appointed an interim president. This temporary president held a press conference announcing that, following an internal investigation and collaboration with the authorities, our representative director, chairman, Mr. Carlos Ghosn, According to the internal investigation, we discovered significant misconduct laid, led by Mr. Gunn himself. They discovered significant financial and administrative misconduct by the CEO, Carlos. Based on this, they decided to remove him from his position immediately. Carlos was shocked by what was happening. He hadn't anticipated the betrayal and backstabbing coming from his own company's board of directors. He continued to deny and affirm that all the charges against him were baseless. The primary accusation was his failure to disclose the amounts paid to him by the company, which, if undisclosed, meant he wouldn't pay taxes on that income. However, his salary was known to the authorities, exposing the flaw in the allegations. Carlos had created a retirement fund for himself, amounting to millions of dollars. This was indeed a reality. After retirement, he planned to receive a substantial amount. However, the company's management and board were supposed to decide the exact amount. Suddenly, Japanese authorities questioned Carlos about why he hadn't disclosed this sum. He explained that the amount was not yet determined and that he would disclose it in the future after retirement, as he had not received it yet. However, Japanese authorities insisted that this was financial deception. The case, from its inception, was peculiar, appearing to be fabricated. Even stranger was the way authorities treated Carlos. He was placed in solitary confinement for three months in a strict prison called Kosuge. I've been told that there are about 2,000 prisoners in Kosuge. You have all the people condemned to death. You know, it smells death. Imagine solitary confinement for a non-violent, non-criminal case in a small cell for three months. During these three months, it became evident that Nissan's board of directors was leading a smear campaign against Carlos, especially in the public eye. They accused him of buying houses and apartments in Paris, Beirut, and Brazil at the company's expense. However, Carlos insisted that the board was well aware of these properties and that he used them for work due to the demands of managing two companies, requiring constant travel. Besides, the ownership of these properties belonged to the company, not him. Another charge arose from a celebration he organized for the 15th anniversary of the Renault-Nissan alliance, coinciding with Carlos Gosen's birthday. The extravagant event cost more than $700,000 and took place at the Palace of Versailles in France, designed in the style of 17th century parties. Now, the company questions whether this was a celebration for the Alliance or just Carlos Gosen's birthday. Perhaps Carlos had in mind to combine these two occasions, but this party had happened years ago, and it was not secretive or embezzlement in secret. So why didn't the board of directors address it until now? It was evident that this was an attempt to pile up the most significant number of charges against Carlos. But what could be the reason that led Nissan's board to turn against him after 19 years of his presidency? The reason was that the French government had acquired a substantial stake in Renault. This raised concerns that the French government might seek a complete merger between the two companies, not just an alliance. It meant the companies would become one entity, and most likely the name Nissan would disappear, leaving only Renault. In the blink of an eye, they turned him from the hero who saved the company into a corrupt villain. This transformation wasn't confined to Japan, it extended to France as well. His image was completely tarnished in front of the public and the global audience. What's strange is that the French government, supposed to defend him in this situation, responded with silence. Even Renault, the company he saved and once led, remained oddly unresponsive. It was as if, suddenly, a global conspiracy had been plotted against Carlos. During this period, Carlos was in prison. The public prosecutor's office lacked substantial evidence against him, so they attempted to extract confessions from him by any means necessary. Relentless interrogations were conducted continuously, sometimes extending up to 14 hours without the presence of a lawyer. They even resorted to threats indicating that if he didn't confess, they would intensify their efforts delving deeper into his personal life, potentially involving his wife, family, and children. A literal eye for an eye. They employed isolation techniques in solitary confinement and used pressure tactics during interrogations to try and coerce confessions from him. They literally treated him like a hostage, but Carlos remained steadfast. 
rejecting all charges throughout the three months he spent incarcerated. Finally, after three months of solitary confinement, the court in Tokyo allowed Carlos Gosen to be released on bail, set at 1 billion Japanese yen, approximately $9 million. Carlos, compelled to pay the bail, had no other option. As he emerged from prison, he was surrounded by an extensive media presence, with journalists even following his car by helicopter until he reached his apartment. Maintaining residence outside the apartment became challenging for several weeks, as reporters besieged the area. However, Carlos and his wife managed to move freely, though journalists surrounded them from all directions, making it difficult even to reach their cars. During this period, Carlos began organizing his affairs, gathering information and announcing on Twitter that he would hold a press conference on Thursday, April 11th. In this conference, he vowed to unveil all the truths that were unfolding. The plan was to stand before the public and expose the alleged conspiracy against him. Yet in less than 24 hours after posting this tweet, Japanese authorities surrounded Carlos's apartment and arrested him once again. They feared that even allowing him to speak before the public might pose a threat. Imagine being arrested again despite having posted bail. However, Carlos and his legal team were aware of this possibility, so they recorded a video as an alternative message in case he was arrested. And that's precisely what happened. If you are listening to me through this video today, it means that I was not able to make the press conference. That, But I wanted to tell you the essence of the message that I wanted to develop on April the 11th and hopefully answer the, so many questions that I'm sure you have on your mind. The first message is I'm innocent. After the second arrest, Carlos remained detained for 21 days before being released on bail once again. This time, he had to pay around $5 million, making the total bail amount an astounding $14 million. Strangely, this time, the authorities imposed unusual and bizarre conditions. The first condition was that they would confiscate his Lebanese and Brazilian passports, leaving him only with his French passport as a strong identification document. The second and expected condition was that he was prohibited from leaving Japan. He had to stay in the country. The third condition was the seizure of his personal devices, including his laptop and phone. The fourth and strangest condition was an absolute ban on communicating with his wife and family. This meant he couldn't contact them through any means. Violating the terms of his release would result in his immediate re-arrest. Such a condition, preventing him from meeting his wife and family, was insane. It was clear they wanted to break him, as they knew his wife was one of his crucial support pillars, and by isolating him, they aimed to make him more vulnerable to breaking. When Carlos heard these conditions, he understood that the Japanese authorities were not intending goodwill. Immediately, he requested his lawyer to tell his wife to return to Beirut. He wanted to distance his family and loved ones from this place, because he realized that justice would not prevail there. In Japan, the prosecutor's success rate in their cases was an unbelievable 99.4%. Winning against the prosecutor was nearly impossible. As seen in the unfolding drama, it was apparent to Carlos that a fair trial was out of the question, prompting him to contemplate escaping from this country. After Carlos was released on bail, he stayed in one of the houses in Japan. He was supposed to await his trial, but he had the freedom of movement within Japan only. Carlos required a lifeline to plan his daring escape. However, obtaining a phone was no ordinary task. He needed one off the grid, completely undocumented. To secure this vital tool, he was willing to pay a hefty sum. What made it even more thrilling was that the Japanese authorities remained blissfully ignorant of this phone. Imagine making calls in the bathroom with running water to ensure that no prying ears beyond those walls could decipher his words. The big question was, who were the individuals communicating with Carlos? and who were the people helping him escape. This information remained undisclosed, as revealing their identities could pose a risk and lead to accountability. However, what we do know is that Carlos had a team of 10 people assisting him in planning this operation. Their initial idea was to escape by sea, but traveling by sea to a country like Lebanon would take a considerable amount of time. The second option, escaping by air, presented challenges since Carlos was forbidden to travel. How could he board a plane without airport security checking his identity? Here, the escape team conducted thorough research on various Japanese airports. They entered and exited multiple airports to study their security procedures. They discovered a significant loophole in one airport, Osaka, a relatively small and quiet airport. What the team noticed at this airport was that large boxes, such as those carrying musical instruments, were not screened with x-rays. The x-ray machine at the airport was designed to accommodate travel-sized suitcases. 
These large boxes were too big to pass through the machine. This discovery led to a crazy and daring idea to escape with Carlos inside one of these boxes. The plan involved two individuals posing as a musical band arriving in Osaka on a private plane. Their instruments and equipment, including the box with Carlos inside, would be transported on this private jet. They would enter the airport, claiming to have a concert in Tokyo, followed by another one in Istanbul. This way, their entry and exit from Japan would be swift, all within the same day. These two individuals who posed as musicians had their cover identities exposed. The first one, Mike Taylor, was a former soldier in the U.S. Special Forces, while the second, George Zayek, also had a military background in Lebanon. These two were going to play the role of musicians who would help Carlos escape from Japan. The idea was wild, and even Carlos was initially hesitant. However, when they crunched the numbers, he realized that there was no other way forward. The problem was that Carlos's every move within Japan was being closely monitored, as his freedom was limited to staying within the country. Taking a lengthy trip to Osaka would surely raise suspicions. Carlos himself could spot some individuals who clearly appeared to be from the Japanese authorities, scattered around his house, constantly watching him. So, Carlos asked his lawyer if it was legal for them to surveil his home in this manner. The lawyer replied, It's not technically within their rights, but it's hard to prove. Carlos then asked, So, what's the solution? The lawyer suggested, We could involve some journalists who are interested in exposing scandals. If we inform them about this, it might disrupt the authorities' surveillance. Carlos indeed reached out to some journalists and newspapers. When these journalists arrived, Carlos noticed that the undercover agents and monitors promptly disappeared from the scene, as their presence being exposed could turn into a major embarrassment for the authorities. So, when the journalists arrived, they found no one to report on, and after a while, they left. However, after some time had passed, these monitors started returning to the area. Carlos could see them parked in their black cars or standing on the street in front of his house. But at least now, if he needed to shake them off, all he had to do was contact the journalists and those monitors would vanish in an instant. In the end, the team responsible for smuggling Carlos set December 29, 2019, as the day to execute this daring escape operation. However, there was a problem. Carlos was a well-known figure in Japan and his foreign appearance made him stand out, which complicated matters. Luckily, it was wintertime, so Carlos bundled up in an oversized jacket, wore a winter hat, and donned a medical mask on his face. It was common for the Japanese to wear medical masks in winter to fend off illness. Carlos quickly called the journalists and informed them that the monitors were stationed outside his home. He assured them he would get rid of them this time. But as usual, the monitors were swiftly informed that journalists were looking for them, prompting them to leave the scene before the reporters arrived. As soon as Carlos noticed the monitors had vanished, he left his home, cleverly disguised in winter attire that concealed his identity. He headed to a hotel called the Grand Hyatt, where he met the two individuals who would aid in his escape Mike Taylor and George Zayek. They provided him with guidance on how to avoid drawing attention while making their way to the airport. They then hailed a taxi and headed to the train station, where they boarded a high-speed train bound for Osaka. Upon reaching Osaka, they checked into another hotel, where the container that would carry Carlos was waiting for them. They began testing the container to ensure Carlos could breathe comfortably. Eventually, they made small openings in the container to allow for air circulation. Carlos changed into lighter clothing and entered the container. They covered it with a light sheet to prevent anyone from spotting him immediately, and then sealed it shut. They contacted the hotel staff to transport the container downstairs. The two men assisting Carlos made a request to the hotel staff to handle the container with utmost care because it contained valuable and delicate musical equipment. Afterward, they loaded the container onto a truck. Interestingly, the truck also carried a similar-looking container to Carlos's. This container indeed contained speakers and musical instruments. Upon arriving at the airport, the two men began transporting the two containers toward customs. Meanwhile, Carlos was inside his container, listening to the conversations in Japanese. The containers were in motion, but then they suddenly stopped. At this point, Carlos realized they had reached a customs inspection point. He overheard one of the men assisting him saying to the customs officials that their music event had been highly successful and thanked them for their cooperation and facilitation. These two men had arrived in Japan on the same day through the same airport customs earlier in the morning, claiming they had a musical event in Tokyo on that day and intended to depart from Tokyo later. Customs officials began questioning them about the contents of the containers. 
The two men explained that the containers held musical instruments and informed them that the containers had already been inspected earlier that morning upon their arrival in Osaka. Now, they were simply retrieving their instruments and equipment to catch their private flight to Istanbul for their next performance. This situation wasn't unusual for this time of year because it's a time when year-end parties and concerts are quite common. One of the men who was with Carlos warned the customs officers to handle these boxes carefully because they contained sensitive musical instruments. He emphasized that if they were handled roughly, the instrument's melodies could be ruined. They explained that they had another concert in Istanbul right after this one in Tokyo and hoped not to be delayed. Since they had already inspected the boxes in the morning and the men were traveling on their private plane, they didn't see any major issues. Carlos, who was inside one of the boxes, overheard two customs officers joking with each other, suggesting that the men were probably smuggling beautiful girls inside those boxes. That was it. They didn't inspect the boxes any further, nor did they attempt to open them. Instead, they focused on checking the passenger's carry-on luggage and allowed them to proceed. So, the two men successfully left the airport with their boxes and instruments, heading straight for their private plane to travel to their Istanbul concert. Carlos himself admitted that this plan shouldn't have worked, but luck was on their side that day. They had chosen to travel at the end of the year, a time when many employees take vacations. Those who remained were often less experienced, as the more seasoned workers usually took time off during this period. The group left the airport with their boxes and headed to their private plane. Carlos had to remain hidden in the box until the plane took off. He anxiously waited inside, fearing that something might go wrong and expose his escape plan. But finally, after about half an hour, he heard the sound of the plane and felt it moving on the runway. The plane was taking off, and Carlos could finally breathe a sigh of relief, knowing they were leaving Japan behind. One of Carlos's accomplices opened the box and joined him in the plane's rear cabin, which was closed off from the rest of the passengers, so no one in the plane knew about Carlos. This person was responsible for bringing food and water. The plane landed at Istanbul's airport, where a new person came on board and escorted Carlos off the plane. They quickly transferred him to another plane waiting at the airport, ensuring that he never set foot in the terminal. This new plane was bound for Beirut. The flight to Beirut was short, lasting only about an hour. As soon as Carlos disembarked, he was recognized by customs officials who welcomed him warmly. In Beirut, Carlos was a well-known name, and the Lebanese people stood in support of him from the beginning of his legal ordeal. They even put up signs in the streets to show their support. The customs official in Beirut greeted Carlos and congratulated him on his arrival in Lebanon. There, Carlos knew he had reached safe shores once again. He reunited with his wife and family, and the news of his daring escape from Japan spread like wildfire across the world. The Japanese authorities and media were in a frenzy over the situation. They accused Carlos Gosen's lawyers of negligence and claimed they hadn't monitored him properly. But that wasn't their job. The Japanese authorities issued an Interpol arrest warrant to bring Carlos back. However, Lebanon is one of the countries that doesn't extradite its citizens to other countries. It was clear that Lebanon's stance would be to protect Carlos. Immediately after that, Carlos held a big press conference in Beirut, standing in front of the world and presenting a strong defense against the allegations against him. He disclosed all the information he had. In the end, he said it plainly. He didn't escape from justice. He escaped from the absence of justice. I left Japan because I wanted justice. I was left with no other choice but to protect myself and my family. That's why I left Japan. I didn't run from justice. I want justice because justice is the only way I'm going to establish my reputation and the only way what I've done during my life is going to be recognized to its value. Since then, Carlos has appeared in numerous interviews on various international channels. He also appeared in a documentary film discussing all the details of his case openly. The only thing he was cautious about was his escape from Japan as he wanted to protect the people who helped him in that operation. Lebanese authorities offered to hand over the case files and to have Carlos tried in Lebanese courts. But the Japanese authorities rejected this and still demand Carlos Gosen's extradition to Japan to stand trial there. Carlos Gosen continues to live in Lebanon with his family to this day. The case is still pending in Japanese courts, and there is still a significant risk of his arrest if he leaves Lebanon due to the arrest warrant Japan submitted to Interpol. Even France has submitted an Interpol arrest warrant for Carlos, 
after conducting an internal investigation in Renault. But apparently, no concrete evidence has emerged to prove the charges against Carlos. On the contrary, Carlos has consistently spoken openly about his case, unlike the Japanese system, which dealt with the case aggressively and with a clear bias at every step. But no one can know exactly what happened until all the evidence is revealed someday in the future. And here we are, reaching the end of today's story and looking forward to the next one. But for now, let's dive into this exciting video. Ciao.